In this lecture, you will examine the causes, course, and consequences of the Monroe Doctrine, which is a fundamental principle of United States foreign policy. At the end of this lecture, you need to be able to define foreign policy, doctrine, corollary, and sovereignty. Explain what caused Monroe's government to develop the doctrine. Identify who created the policy. List and describe all the components of the Monroe Doctrine. And describe the Roosevelt Corollary. So let's look at our definitions. First word we need to know is policy. A policy is a plan or course of action used by a government, group, or individual. When we're talking about governments, we often refer to two different kinds of policy, either domestic policy, which is a plan for dealing with issues inside a country, or foreign policy, which is a plan for dealing with issues with other countries. The Monroe Doctrine is really going to focus on foreign policy. Now, a doctrine is a stated principle of government policy or a belief or set of beliefs held by a group. So it's kind of the ideas that are behind the policy. Then you have a corollary. A corollary is a direct or natural consequence or result from something else. And then finally, sovereignty. Sovereignty is the authority of a state to govern itself or another state. So let's look at some current events back in the early 1800s. So at that time, the Napoleonic War was going on in Europe. Major European countries like Britain, Spain, Portugal, and Russia were focused on battling France. France was being led by an emperor named Napoleon. He was a great military conqueror, and his armies are marching all up and down Europe at this time. They're so focused on trying to defeat Napoleonic France that they weaken their control over their colonies in the Americas. Countries like Mexico and Brazil fight for and win their independence during this time, and many new countries are going to be formed in South America between 1783 and 1823. Russia is also going to claim land in North America that's even further south than Alaska that goes all the way down to the area that we would think of today as Oregon. And they forbid others like the U.S. from passing into their territory. Once the Napoleonic Wars start to end, Spain and Portugal are both going to look to regain their lost empires in North and South America. So this is your first practice. You're going to read the following statements and mark them as true or false. If the statement is false, use the space provided on your worksheet to change it to a true statement. Try and do this without looking at your notes first, and then use your notes to check your answers if you need to. You can pause the video if you need to do that. In October of 1823, President James Monroe is going to be afraid of these European nations trying to reclaim their sovereignty in the Americas and reestablish their empires there. First, he's going to go to two former presidents for advice, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Both of them are going to tell Monroe, you know what, you should join forces with Britain. With the United States and Britain working together, they can keep other European nations out of North and South America. He's also going to talk to his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams thinks that the U.S. should try and go it alone. The U.S. needs to establish itself as the predominant power in the Western Hemisphere. Monroe is going to follow Adams' suggestion, and he's going to create a foreign policy doctrine that declared that the United States is the leader and protector of North and South America. Adams actually wrote the speech where Monroe outlined this policy, his Monroe Doctrine. The doctrine has been followed by presidents in the United States for the last two centuries, and it has been used to justify dozens of military, political, and economic actions. Here's your practice number two. Read the following statements and mark them as true or false. If the statement is false, use the space provided on your worksheet to change it to a true statement. Try and do this without looking at your notes, and then go back and use your notes if you need to check your answers. And you can pause the video if you need to pause the video. So in Monroe's speech, he outlines these four points of what would become known as the Monroe Doctrine. 
Point number one is the U.S. is going to stay out of Europe, and that means the U.S. is not going to get involved in wars in Europe, in disputes between European countries, if those disputes are focused in Europe. Point number two, the U.S. is not going to interfere with any existing European colonies inside the Americas. An example would be Canada. Canada was controlled by the British. If it had been controlled by the British, the U.S. is not going to interfere with the Canadians. Point number three, no new European colonies can be formed in the Americas. That means that what the Europeans already have, they can't increase the size of, they can't form anything new. The fourth point, any European interference in a country in North or South America is going to be considered a hostile act toward the United States. So if one of those European countries tries to undermine a government, in Central or South America, the U.S. is going to view that as a hostile action towards the United States, an act of war. Now, about 80 years later, the Monroe Doctrine is going to be expanded by a later president named Theodore Roosevelt. He's going to expand this doctrine in 1904, and you can really think of this as the fifth point of the Monroe Doctrine. So this is what's referred to as the Roosevelt Corollary. And remember, a corollary is a direct result from something else. So if you think of those four points, Roosevelt's Corollary is really something that's going to kind of automatically fall if you're doing those four points of the Monroe Doctrine. So what the Roosevelt Corollary basically said is that the U.S. can intervene in Latin America if Number one, they misbehave, and that could mean just something simple as in their country is doing something the U.S. government doesn't like. They don't like their form of government, they don't like their leader, they don't like their issues with human rights, could be anything like that. Second thing would be if they don't pay their debts. If the United States has loaned the country money, or United States businesses have loaned money to the country, and the country refuses to pay back that money, the United States can use that as a reason to intervene in the country. And intervene in the country could mean all kinds of things. It could mean something simple, like sending in advisors, or it could mean a full-fledged invasion and installing a new government. Many Latin American countries viewed this policy as a way for the U.S. to justify violating their own sovereignty. So this is a way the U.S. can kind of force themselves on all these smaller, weaker Latin American countries. That's the way they viewed it. So practice number three, you're going to read the following statements, mark them as true or false, and if they're false, you're going to go ahead and use the space provided to change them into. After you finish that practice, you're going to see a very simple chart in your worksheet. I want you to kind of evaluate the Monroe Doctrine. On one side, I want you to list the pros, which are the good things about the Monroe Doctrine from the United States perspective or from the perspective of other countries. And then on the other side, you can list the cons, the bad things about it. There's certainly more than two apiece. You could probably list 10 apiece very easily, but I want you to try and come up with at least two. If you can come up with more, all the better, because we can use that in class. This concludes our video lecture on the Mineral Doctrine.